<laughs> it's time to buckle up. Buckle up. <laughs> We're going to do a segment on uh, motors. I'm going to do a little piece with Mike, and we're going to give you a rough idea how to check the windings for open winding, shorted winding, and grounded winding, and what to look for. So um, I have a courtesy of Mike and, and uh, his ability to take things apart for me. <laughs> I have a couple of motors sitting here. These are, these are uh, what, one-third horse motors? They're, they're permanent split capacitor motors. With permanent, permanent split capacitor motors. Um, but I wanted to be able to show you, so thanks to Mikey, that is the rotor. I'm gonna zoom Let's in here. That over. Okay, sorry, that's the rotor. Mm -hmm. That's the spinny part. The this rotating is the, part. The, <laughs> this is the uh, stator, and these are the windings. So when, we, when you're checking a motor winding, that's the copper, and if you look at it, it's wound, 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 wound. So that's got windings in it. And that's where the, and then down inside, hard to see, but those are the uh, rotor bars. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for, was the rotor bars. Here, I thought so, I made it up. No, <laughs> you didn't make it up. That was the word I was looking for, thank you. Uh, so what happens on a, what happens a lot of times on the, the windings, you see these are all uh, nice and shiny. And when we talk about having a burnt motor or a grounded motor or a shorted motor, if it's shorted, it's, it's going from winding to winding. I don't, it's hard to see here that it's a two different loops that we're looking at. Or in this case, here's one loop, here's one loop, and here's one loop. So, a winding to winding short doesn't necessarily mean that it grounded to the case or hit the rotor bars. What it means is that the windings burnt and they are touching each other. And how you would see that, and that's where I'll let Mikey use the, the meter, is if, I think it's still on ohms, Mikey. For you guys, ohms is the uh, upside down horseshoe looking thing. <laughs> So if it was to be a shorted winding, I believe now you have a zero, zero point something. That means that the windings are shorted or touching each other. If the winding was open, when you check your lead, the windings are open, not making a connection. And then grounded, you would go from one lead and actually touch the ground of the motor or if the motor's installed and you probably are reading OL on that. Yeah, in a lot of, a lot of cases you'll have a, a wire coming from one of the, the screws that go through here that actually goes to ground. So you can read there as well. So if it was, and I will simulate that, if you had a winding that was shorted, and I'll try and simulate that, if you had a winding that was shorted by hooking up your lead to one wire and then touching chassis ground, now it doesn't read OL, it actually has a reading, which means that the winding itself is grounded to the chassis of the motor, touching ground, AKA grounded motor. And the same thing goes for, I mean, this is, these are fan motors, but the same thing goes for a compressor um, I can't pick up a compressor anymore, and I was taking it easy on Mike and didn't make him drag one up there. <laughs> but the same thing goes for, for motors. Now, these are, these are two, uh, two wire or four wire um, fan motors, meaning that two wires go to power and two wires go to the capacitor. If you've got a three wire motor, then one is going to power one is going to the power on the capacitor and one is going to the capacitor by itself. One thing I'd like to hit. Um, <clears throat> Not me. No, never you. <laughs> um, one, one of the things about the, the, sh the shorted windings, um, all you've got is just a mass of copper winding there. And what happens is it shorts together somewhere in the winding. And so you put an ohmmeter on there and you can still see a relatively same reading between different windings, even if one of them shorted. 
Yeah, partway through. So in a lot of cases, you would pick that up as an overcurrent with an amp probe. You can see it as an overcurrent. Now, yeah. um, you know, going back to that too, to elaborate more on the windings, a three-phase winding, if I'm ohming winding to winding, should always be the same. Yes. On a single-phase motor, R, our common to R is a high resistance. Common to start is a less resistance. And run to start is the equal of common and start and common and run. Ooh, how do you like that? I'll tell you, I'm impressed. I was too. <clears throat> I remembered that. I had to go look up the single phase motors. I haven't done one in so damn long. <laughs> and so three phase motors, if you're reading it, it you, know, you don't have common start run on a, on a three phase motor. It's L1, L2, L3. So you, what you're looking for is that the ohms resistance, not continuity, ohms resistance between common start and run when you do that test would be you're looking for the same uh, ohm reading. Can you explain how to mega ohm a three phase nine lead motor? What are the readings you're looking for? I go way deep in the weeds. I, I, the way I mega ohm uh, a motor is probably different than the way Mike does. If it's, if it's the same, I would be really shocked. <laughs> I don't apply uh, mega ohm power to L1, L2. I read all my mega ohm readings to ground. It's always a ground reference for me. Yeah, no, definitely. <clears throat> um, the thing is with the, the nine lead motor, that allows you to change the wiring to go from a 230 to a 460. <gasps> huh? I've got a trick. You've got a trick? I do. I have a trick. Cool. I, I, just, I have to show the trick. So this is a perfect nine lead motor. All I did was open up my phone and bring up the calculator. Here's a little, Put it in your pocket trick for a nine lead motor. If you're wiring it for high voltage, you wire, and this is hard for me to see because I have one of them smokes. You wire four to seven together, five to eight together, six to nine together, and power goes to one, two, and three. That's for high voltage. Your low voltage is four, five, six get tied together, one goes to seven, two goes to eight, three goes to nine. And that's where you hook up your high voltage leads. You know, since we're talking about three phase motors, <laughs> you know, one of the drives was a really big thing in my early days. And one of the biggest problems yes, we would find was on the connections between your like um, five and four and seven, five and eight, six and nine, the wire nuts would come loose and there was enough of a resistance there where it didn't blow fuses. You just got really weird imbalances and things like that. So a really good thing to do is to open up that junction box and look in there to check connections and make sure they're good. I don't know how many service calls I went out on where they said, oh, the motor's bad, the drive's bad. Pull the cover off and see the wires burn. Clip loose, them. Loose connections <clears throat> yep. in the pecker head of the motor. I was avoiding using that I term. know you were. <laughs> I know you were, but the guy's got to get used to it. It's. Uh, I use that term in front of some young ladies and I they got, get upset. Oh, they got but, upset. <clears throat> but that's truly what they call that cover. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, uh, on the smaller fractional motors, well, fractional, not fractional horsepower, but, but, the, <laughs> but the lower your, your half horse, your one horse pumps, uh, all the way up to like a five horse pump, the pecker head really isn't big enough, um, uh, to do, but I like, I think well, some guys call them the kernies. Yeah, but they'll have a little tiny thing here that they can either. Well, the, you, but yeah, you got to use wire nuts. Yeah. Because I like them. to do the, I like to do the clamps, the, I, the split bolts. They got new things now. As long as you've got enough room for them. I can't think of what they call those oh, either. God, I can't either. They came out those really special ones that had the. Uh, but it's got the insulator and the whole bit. Yeah, you, you take pull the different Allen plugs wrench. and yep, and yep. You just wrap a little bit of tape. So tell me what that is, guys. That's that's I forget technology within the last ten years. Or, <laughs> and but split bolts is Come all. Come on, guys, I can... tell them. Leave it in the chat. What is it? <laughs> We're waiting. Or Don't you wish you would ask that question? We'd be sending you a package right now because it stumps both of us. <sighs> But we came up with it ourselves. We go. <laughs> <laughs>
Rebase I've, question one more time and I'll... Can you explain how to mega ohm a three-phase nine-lead motor? Yes. So I did not complete that question. Thank you. So how I do it, Mike agreed that that's the way he does it, is you take one lead from the mega meter to ground, and it's a ground reference. What should that be? Depends on the horsepower of the motor and what its atmosphere is. If its atmosphere is air, meaning it's out in the open, um, I would expect to be no less than or no more than 500 to 1,000 mega ohms is what I would expect to see because you're testing the, the resistance of the winding. You're testing the insulation. So it's actually how much power goes to ground. And a true mega meter is a uh, thousand volts. So see, you can teach us old guys scientific stuff. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Back to his question though. When, when you're reading face to face, your mega ohm's gonna, not going to do anything because you're looking for a real high resistance. You're not going to see that on a face to face. Yeah, I don't do I don't yeah. do face to face mega ohm readings. That only that only opens up that winding. It subjects to that winding to a thousand volts and will probably start breaking down the insulation. Um, so taking, for example, L1, L2, L3, taking that and making a reference. And that's really what it is, is a reference. If you're, if you're using it as a diagnostic tool, it'll tell you if it's grounded because it'll get down below 500 mega ohms. Pretty much it's grounded in a dry atmosphere. Um, I use the megas uh, for chiller work, uh, centrifugal work, and we had to uh, baseline that machine uh, every year. And doing the mega ohm readings, it was a reference from L1, L2, L3 to ground and, and recorded mm -hmm. so that we could see if the winding itself was starting to uh, deteriorate. One of the places I came into it a lot was on cooling tower fan motors and that, mm -hmm. because they would the drives would go off on a ground fault. And it was because of the fact that there was breakdown in the windings, the moisture would conduct. Yep. And so, you know, I mean, I have, I've had people say to me, you know, Mike, I got a really low mega ohm reading. Did you get a call on that? No. Are you having problems with anything? No. I let it run till the motor burns up. <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's and it's the same thing. You get into my my uh, centrifugal motors would be anywhere from six hundred and fifty to seven hundred and fifty mega ohms. That's different. You want to find that before you put the damn thing back together. <laughs> well, no, no, that was that was refrigerant in it. So we were doing our annuals, oil changes, okay. and things like that, and we were just taking the baseline reading and comparing it to last year's baseline reading. Uh, and that's where you see it starting to break down. So if last year it was 725 and this year it's 575, we know that that motor is going to have to come down. Yep. Because uh, you don't want them to fail. No. That would be bad. That would be, that would be bad. That would be bad. <laughs> we have one, another one that was sent in by Steve. It's a little bit lengthy. Okay. Um, oh, can I summarize that one, Steve? Thank you very much for <laughs> sure. submitting the question. Fantastic, beautiful description of what you're looking for. Uh, what Steve has is a train unit, okay. and uh, Steve, the term is soft starter. So you, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to start the motor slow so that it quits burning up the belts. You can also try putting in a cog belt instead of the v, uh, standard A or B. You can go with a AX or a BX belt, and, and that might help you as well. Uh, also stop chewing up. His tension is good. This okay. is all in his story. I'm sorry. Okay. He's, his story is he's he's burning up belts um, and, and everything's lined up. Everything's properly tensioned. But due to the torque at startup, the belt still squeals and burns rubber. In that case, so I, I, what I, he's asking to do is his thought, which is a good start. With, he doesn't, uh, the term he used was a slow starter. So that's why I corrected. The term is actually a soft starter because you're not using the VFD to maintain anything other than taking the motor from zero RPM all the way up to 60 Hertz or its full capacity. Uh, they call that a soft starter. So in his question, and, and he's going down the right road, is what would be the, what would be a VFD that you would use for that application, the manufacturer? And, and, 
and I know AC Tech makes them, ABB makes them, Yaskawa makes them. VFDs or soft starts? Well, I, I, he asked specifically for a VFD. Okay. And I know that you can use a VFD to either yeah. maintain static amp draw, but you can also use it for a, a, a soft, soft starter, starter. Yeah. Uh, zero to 60 hertz. Yep. Yeah, Benshaw, ABB, Septronics, they all make dedicated soft starters. Dedicated soft starter. Yep. Um, and then uh, I know AC Tech, AC Tech, AC Tech, mm -hmm. uh, Yaskawa, and ABB, they all make a uh, smaller uh, VFD. Yeah. So I don't recommend any one over another. Uh, I've worked on all of them. Mikey, you've cut your teeth on Dan Foss, ABB, Yaskawa. Parametrics. Let's go Par back 100 years. Parametrics. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. Use what you're comfortable with. If you if you don't know anything about any of them, um, the easiest one to program um, for me was um, Dan Foss and ABB. Those were the easiest ones to program. So, thank you, Steve. How do I check a motor to see if it's grounded? Basically, disconnect your your, your leads from power, and connect your ohm meter with one leg to ground and with one leg to the, the windings of the motor. And the reason you want to disconnect them is because if the ground is, let's say that there's a ground in one of the wires going to the motor, I want to isolate that out of there so I'm actually reading the motor to see if the motor's grounded. So I don't know how many times people have changed out a motor and they put it in and they're like, wow, the new motor's grounded too. Well, it wasn't the motor, it was one of the wires. Picture this, guys. Picture this. Your motor is connected to the contactor. What Mikey just told you to do was disconnect the wires from the contactor, grab one of your leads and put it on the wire. Your other lead is connected to ground. In this case, I'm using the motor. And then you look at your meter and you see that you're not doing a reading. If the motor was grounded, keep an eye on that meter. You got it. If the motor was grounded, now you have an ohm reading. It doesn't say OL. Thanks for the question. See, a lot of a lot of times, one of the things that you'll run into is like where the wires go into the motor and stuff like that. They can rub, and they'll turn around and they'll go to ground. And so it'll give all the indications of being grounded when it's not the motor, it's the wires going into it. So be careful of that. And I will caution you as well that if you were to do that on a compressor, take your leads out of the contactor and, and read to ground and then you show an ohm reading, the next step, don't just automatically condemn that compressor because the compressor has prongs on it as well. Mm -hmm and you can burn a prong and that wire is actually touching the case and the compressor is not grounded. So always, if you see it at the contactor and go, oh, I got a grounded compressor, then always go get to cover off of that compressor and physically look at it, disconnect the wires at that point and read it. You want to get as far into it as you can at the terminals yep. on the compressor or the terminals in the motor. You want to you want to get in there so you don't have a lot of other things that where the ground could be. And the reason for disconnecting it is so that you're not reading other motors or other components in the system. You want to make sure that you're isolated to the component you're testing. Yep. Ha. I like that, that one. That sounded right good. <laughs> so what happens to a motor if the capacitor goes bad? Ooh, I like that one. Ooh, that's a good one. Go ahead. Yeah, you, dance, you dance on that Why one is that a good one? Well, because it's a permanent split capacitor motor. And what the capacitor does is kind of causes a phase shift. And so the one phase is chasing the other one, which is what gives the motor its torque and to run. Mm -hmm. If you have a weak capacitor, and we just had one in, in Phoenix, where it was like a 45 ohm or 45 microfarad capacitor, and the compressor wouldn't start. And I told the guys, I says, check the capacitor. It was like 12 microfarads. They swapped out the, the capacitor, compressor started right up. Yep. Because it's shifting the phase to get the compressor or the motor 
running. And so and if you're getting it, a little boost out of it. Yep. And so if the capacitor is weak, you're not getting anywhere near as much boost or as much phase shift. And the other thing too with a permanently split capacitor motor is if the capacitor goes bad, and uh, I see this a lot on uh, condenser fan motors, mm -hmm. it can do one of two things. It's going to sit there and, and hum, vibrate, yep. not turn. But the other thing I've seen it do is you get these things on a roof and, and the wind, there's enough breeze that the motor actually starts spinning backwards mm -hmm. when the unit calls for cooling. And when that happens, the motor will continue to go backwards. And instead of pulling, pulling through and out the top, it's like sucking. Yep. And, and so yep. your indicator is to, to look at the capacitor. Um, not all bad capacitors go pregnant. No. <laughs> nice terminology. <laughs> Not all of them poof out. You no. can, they're, they're great to see, that's a fun thing to see and be thankful that uh, the powers that be that make capacitors put putting that PCB PCB stuff in there, <laughs> that black, nasty, stinky, oh yeah, burn stuff. Now there's, there's two things that I would consider, maybe three when you're looking at a capacitor. Brian hit on number one as the capacitors will get all bloated and kind of blown out. Another thing you'll see sometimes is leakage around the terminals. Oh, yeah, oily. <clears throat> yep, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. The other thing you'll see is corroded terminals. If you've got a problem like that, I mean, a capacitor is 12, 15 bucks, worst case. And to save, you know, an $800 or $1,000 compressor, it's not a bad idea to change it. You know, I had a call the other day. I know this has nothing, but you, you were talking about the terminals and that made me remember this. Um, the machine was only two months old. They installed it two months ago, but, and you've seen this, they come off two pressure controls, high pressure, mm -hmm. high pressure and low pressure. So off the control board, it goes to the low pressure switch. From the low pressure switch, it jumps over to the high pressure switch. So that wire, those two wires were put together with a connector. So it had the stake on and the stake on. So they put a stake on jumper with, with plastic wrapped around it and plug those in. The, the board would not allow the contactor to pull in. So in talking to this guy, I got him to unplug that connector and read the, he had five ohms resistance. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. He had five ohms <laughs> resistance taking the wires off the board. So he's got one wire, goes to the low pressure switch, jumps over to the high pressure switch, high pressure switch back to him. And he's reading that. And that was five ohms. Unplugged that connector. He read into the, the one that would be feeding the, the low pressure switch out of the lower pressure. He had uh, 0.03 ohms across the switch. Perfect. Do the same thing for the high pressure switch. He did that one, he did that one. He had 0.8. took that, put them back together, he read it again, and it was five point something. And as I said, take that apart, and then strip the wires and put a wire nut on, and his final number was 0.9. So the connector, the, the corroded connector, you know, one two of the, months old. <clears throat> one of the things I saw there in, in Phoenix, and I just wanted to kill some people over it because I got the shit shocked out of me. Did you get burnt? <laughs> I got burnt. <laughs> <laughs> on a lot of these motors, they'll have a pair of wires coming out that have got connectors on them, and you can swap the two wires to change the rotation on the motor. Mm -hmm. Well, there seems to be this trend where they take those wires, those stake-ons, and they stick them up through the, the grill. Stick them up through the grate. Yeah. Well, you get there, and all the plastic's gone. And now it's just nothing but bare metal and sticking up there, and you lean up against that thing, it'll let you know it's there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I went off on a tangent, but it's okay. my point to that whole thing, and we're talking about motors, and we're talking about ohm readings, and and you can have 24 volts, and you got to watch the you got to watch the resistance. The switches were closed, and the switches the tested out right, but when he put it back together, his ohm reading was way too high. You know, one one thing I want to hit on because I, I've run into this so much lately is people will take their meter and they'll reference ground and they'll go to one leg of the motor 
and they'll read and they'll say, okay, I got 120 volts here. And then they turn around and go to the other leg and they say, I got 120 volts here, but my motor doesn't run. Keep in mind that this motor is just a winding. And this motor, I'm not sure if it's 120 or 230, but the thing is, is that you require that full voltage. So if I've got a 230 volt motor or 240 volt motor, and I read from one leg to ground, and then the other leg to ground, and I get the two 120s, it's like, wow, I got my, my 240. But do you actually you have You don't necessarily, because you're reading, <laughs> because this point here is the same as this point here. Yeah. Because it's just a, a coil of wire. So what I'm saying is when you go to check to see if you've got voltage to the motor, you want to go across the two wires. You want to see what the voltage is there. Not to ground, but the voltage across there. Because if it's 240, you want to see 240. So, and we see that a lot when guys get confused on, on color. Mm -hmm. I, you guys talk to me on the phone, I've told you before. Voltage does not care one iota what the color of the wire is. You mean red doesn't go faster? No, doesn't go faster. But if you happen to be, in this case, these are both black wires, and if you got lost and your, and your, other, motor, um, your other motor was a, a black and a blue, and now you got these two blacks, and you know you want 220, so they need to be, I'll get this contactor back up in my hands. So you want to be one on one, one on one side and one on the other. So what Mikey's re talking about is if I read between here, I would have the 230 volts, but by chance, if I happen to hook this up wrong and I had a connector and I put it there and now I read it, each one of these wires is reading the 120 to ground, but it's the same 120. Yeah. So the motor wouldn't run until you get it back over on separated, and now it's 230. And we get that, we yep. actually get that call, and it's because of the confusion, um, guys taking out a three wire uh, condenser fan motor and going back in with a four wire, or vice versa. Yeah. And then, uh, we're all right, call us, we'll walk you through it. How do you check if the motor is working at full capacity? Amp draw. If you've got the correct voltage, if a condenser fan motor is rated for one amp and you're drawing 0.8 or 0.9, it's running at capacity. If it's rated for one amp and you're drawing 0.5 amps, then you can adjust the, where that fan blade is in the shroud and, and get the amperage up. Another one is if it's rated for 1.0 and you're drawing 1.3, you're gonna overheat the motor. Again, adjust the fan blade height in that fan shroud to get it back to no more than 1.0. You know, talking about those terms, I mean, I think there's a couple we ought to talk about. LRA, locked rotor amps. Locked rotor amps. If you turn around and get locked rotor amps, I mean, one thing that I always do when I go to check a motor is I spin it first, just to see if it's gonna spin. On a condenser fan motor, hard to spin a compressor. Yeah, but there but, are ways, yeah. there are ways, there are ways. <laughs> <laughs> you just reach in there, grab this, grab Yeah, the, the yeah, yeah, one. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Not an open drive. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but LRA's locked rotor amps. Full load amps is, if that's a one horse motor, then that's the amperage that that'll pull when it's developing one horse of work or using one horsepower of work. Then there's also a term called running load amps. So let's say they put in a condenser fan motor and they need a 0.8 horsepower motor. So it's not gonna run at the full one horsepower, but it's bigger than a three quarter horse. So they're gonna get the running load amps or the design load. So just be aware of that. Running load amps is- RLA, yep. motor amps is LRA. Yeah. There you go. We got it. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> we still got it. There you go. <laughs> can ECM motors be repaired? Yeah, you can. You, you, you go to the store and you buy a new motor and you put that one in where the old one was. It's now <laughs> repaired. Some of them have got a board you can change. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and that is dependent on uh, manufacturer because some manufacturers, you can separate the board. If you have a bad motor, you can replace the motor and put the same board back on. Other, other manufacturers need to be matched. 
So if the motor's bad, you have to change both. Yep. And inversely, the same thing, I've seen manufacturers where you can change the control head and, and leave the motor there. Speaking of ECM motors, guys, 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 go get the tester. I don't care if it's 50 bucks, 60 bucks, get the tester. It's gonna save you so much trouble. I had a gentleman on the phone the other day and, and after, after going over it three times and it's like, okay, we're now both laughing about this. We both know the horse is dead. Do we need to talk about it for 15 minutes? Or are we just going to agree the horse is dead? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of those... A bad capacitor is a bad capacitor. We don't need to test it four times. <laughs> it's a bad capacitor. <laughs> you know, one of, one of the other things when it comes to three-phase motors is rotation can be critical because if you have a scroll compressor or yeah. certain other things, if you spin them backwards, you get a few seconds before you kill it. Yeah, so some of them are very, very, very yeah. critical on that. That, uh, that few seconds means, oh, I'm just gonna take my pencil and I'm gonna mash in the contactor. And in some compressor, can, if they're running backwards, that's all it took and you just wiped out the Tiberium. Yep. So the thing is, they actually make a phase rotation meter that will show you the rotation generated based upon the wiring. Red light, green light. Oh, I might have a little wheel that went round and round and well, round. Well, there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, and uh, to change the rotation on a three phase, all you do is swap two of your, your power leads and it'll ro change the rotation of the motor. Yep. So I love True. three phase, it's simple. You don't need to worry about capacitors or any of that kind of stuff. I know. <laughs> I, know. I often see ECM motors fail shortly after removing a significant airflow restriction from the system. Any ideas why? Because the, the ECM motor is a torque control motor and they use torque as the means of controlling the speeds. And so now if you remove that obstruction, now the fan motor is going to move a lot more air and it's going to pull a lot more current, which can cause the motor to fail. Could, yeah. What's the name of the ECM motor tester? There's no fancy word to it. It's just the ECM motor test tool. And it doesn't matter whether it's unit specific or a universal uh, one that you would find at your local parts house. You know, um, I think it's Terrain has got a way that you can test an ECM motor with a nine volt battery. Again, <laughs> Fred. <laughs> no, it's actually it's actually in their in their, in their yes. one manual. But the thing is, is that you know there are certain tools that are going to make your life easier. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine working without my my multimeter or my amp probe and right. things like this. And with all the ECM motors out there, you know, everyone's got its own little different test procedure. But with these these ECM test tools, they're set up. There are some universal ones. There are some specific ones. Yeah. But it just makes your life so much easier to be able to test and know what's going on. Because is it the board? Is it the motor? Is it this? You know. Right. And with the and with the test tool, I mean, you're you're literally unplugging from the board, plugging into mm -hmm. these different universal taps, and and being able to power up the test tool. And, mm -hmm. and run tests so you know whether it's the motor or, and, and I, I wish I knew the manufacturer. The one I saw was a universal and, and it actually lights up and tells you what's I'm, going I'm, I'm serious, I didn't mean Google, I meant Amazon. But you can go on Amazon and ECM motor test tool, they run from 50 to 90 bucks. Okay. Is what the ones I saw. Um, it's, it's just, you know, as the industry changes, we have to change with the industry. And so I remember with some of the old flame sensing things and stuff like that, where you had to get the box and plug the box <laughs> in and everything, you know, as things change, we have to get the little tools to make our lives easier. It's all about making, it's yeah. kind of like why we're here. Yep. To make your, we're here life. to make your life easier. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you work on a lot of the ECM motors, get that little test tool. It's worth its weight in gold. Good to have him back, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Peace out. <laughs>